This video is for those of you that like me enjoy recording your piano at home and today I'll give you a walkthrough of the end-to-end -end process from setting up the equipment to producing the final file. Are you sitting comfortably? Then let's begin. Hi, this is Tommy with Tommy's Piano Corner, the place for returning pianists or indeed anybody who loves piano to share tips and ideas of how to get the best from this great hobby. If it's your first trip here, then please do think about subscribing. Simply hit the little icon in the bottom right hand corner of your screen now and it's all done for you. Regular viewers of my channel will, I'm sure, be familiar with the other videos I've produced on recording your piano. These show you in detail how to do certain elements of this process, such as adding reverb to your recordings. However, today's video takes you through the end-to-end -end process. And what I've done is basically I captured exactly what I did when I recorded The Shepherds in the Manger from Liszt's Christmas Tree Suite that I released on Christmas Day. So without any further voiceover, let's get straight into it. First then, we need to set up the equipment. I have a separate tripod I place near the piano where I'll put the phone I use to capture the audio with my Shure MV88 microphone plugged into it. Now I use a microphone stand to get the overhead camera view. I also have this light I use when recording my talking head type video, so I'm using it for good measure as you can never have enough light when you're creating a video. Here at the moment, I'm using my iPad to set the overhead camera view. I use Filmic Pro on my phone to record, and this gives you the option to use an app called Filmic Remote on another device so that you can judge the camera position. Effectively, you remote control the app on your phone, and you can change the focus and exposure without having to look through the actual phone that's doing the recording. This is almost indispensable if you're doing this on your own as a one-man band, as often you'll need to see what the camera is seeing when you're recording yourself, which is not easy to do. I did three takes of this, each time using my different restore points, and ended up using the first to create the final files. Here, I'm downloading the audio recording and then creating my rough cut version. Now that I've repositioned the phone I'm using to do the video recording with, I'm using Filmic Remote again on my iPod to see what the camera is able to see and sort out the focus and everything else. Once we've finished all of the recording, then we can download the results onto our computer. Now I use AirDrop because that comes with Mac, but you could use anything like Google Drive or Dropbox to share files between one device and another. First then, let's look at the audio editing that we need to do to process the audio file we created and get rid of the wrong notes that were in there. In this end-to-end -end process, I use GarageBand a couple of times. As a reminder, I don't try to get a done-in-one-take recording. I always assume that I'm going to make some mistakes here and there, and so I set myself some restore points in the music for that eventuality. This means that rather than having to start again right from the beginning, I can start from somewhere midway through the music and continue forward from there. I explain this process in Volume 2 of my ebook series. However, I also wanted to film a couple of alternative camera angles to use in the main output. And so to do this, I need an audio file with those errors edited out that I can play along to, because I don't have enough phones to film all of these angles in one go. It's important that in this angle, my fingers look in sync. And then of course, in this angle, that the pedal and damper movements look that they're synchronized with the music. So very quickly, I prepared a rough cut of the audio file and just removed the offending portion from the middle. I then simply exported the file through the share menu and airdropped it onto my own iPhone 6. 
I then use this file by plugging one side of my headset into my ear so I can play along on the piano and of course I position it so that you can't see the wires or the phone in the finished video. I then went on to record my alternative camera angles. Once I'd filmed these alternative angles, then the recording process is complete and it's time to move over to the computer. The first thing I did was a proper edit of my audio file. So effectively I took the rough cut that I created earlier and I refined it. So let's have a look at that project. To make things simpler for myself, I have a pre-existing project that's called Piano Mastering. You can see it here. This is a project I created and I sort of use it as a template. I've set up all the plugins I want to use. As a reminder, a plugin is basically the software equivalent of a piece of equipment you plug into your recording setup to perform a specific task. So to add reverberation or EQ, for example. A preset is then a predefined set of settings created for you by an experienced audio engineer that you can use without needing to have a great understanding of what it's doing. You can listen to the result and decide whether you like it or not. I use the Space Designer plugin for reverb and I've taken the Midnight Hall preset. As I explained in volume two of my ebook series, the plugin and preset to use are your personal choice. I found that I quite like this setting as I think it works quite well for my piano and for the room in which I'm recording. Once you've found the one you like, then you can keep going back to the same one. For the EQ, I've used the Channel EQ plugin. I use the Grand Piano EQ1 preset. Again, the one to use is a personal choice, so spend some time playing around until you find the one that you like. All of this, of course, is explained in the ebook in a lot more detail for you. Finally, I've added this limiter plugin and selected the classical music preset. It's really just to avoid any odd notes that might get too loud and distort after I've added EQ and reverb. Hopefully this shouldn't be the case, but just in case, it does no harm to include this plugin. All I then needed to do was open this basic project and drop my newly recorded file into it. When I did the recording, I was quite lucky and only had to go back once, so I just reverted to a restore point once. And this is the point that I now need to deal with. Don't forget, we're looking at the finished project, and as you can see, it has two separate tracks now. The second one was created by right-clicking and selecting a new track with duplicate settings. First, I went to the point just after the restore point where I stopped and went back to the restore point itself. And then I split the file and then dragged the remaining portion down onto the second track, which is where it is now, as you can see. I simply then removed the part I didn't want, so all of the going back and getting myself ready again, and then deleted that part and align the two with the overlap. Using the zoom slider here helps you to see a lot more clearly how to align them. And then to make the transition seamless, I added the set of automation points to each track so that it's possible to reduce the volume of the first track whilst you increase the volume of the second track from zero so that on playback, you don't really hear the join. And you can see how this looks here. And now that we've finished that, all that's left to do is export the result through the share menu. And this gives us the audio file that we're going to next combine with the main video file. Now let's take a look at the iMovie project. I'll walk you through the finished project here. The first one is where I combine the audio output of our GarageBand project and the video file we recorded with the overhead view where you get the best view of my fingers. When you set this up, you'll first put the video file into the timeline and trim off any unwanted portion at the beginning. Remember, the video file will automatically snap to the beginning of the timeline when you place it. Next, we put the audio file into its slot and we adjust the position to sync it up with the video file. 
As we saw when I edited the audio file, I restarted because of an error, and so now we need to remove that error segment from the video file. And you'll see that what I've done here is I found the error, I've split the video file, and you can see that quite clearly, and just deleted the segment with the error. However, before starting to align it, what I need to do is just adjust the speed of the video clip. You might remember I've talked about this before. For some technical reason, when video and audio are recorded, the software records them at minutely different speeds. And so after a minute or so, you can actually start to see them get out of line with each other. You can see the speed editor here, and it's now just a case of selecting it and sliding ever so slightly to the right or to the left until the audio and video are perfectly aligned at the end. The adjustment then works right across the entire clip. Then I simply trimmed both the end of the first clip and the start of the second clip until I was at the point where I wanted the first clip to finish and I wanted the second clip to start. By using the zoom slider, it makes it a lot easier to do this. We can now go to the end of the second clip. We remove any unwanted footage and again, do the synchronization part with the speed editor. After that, I simply remove the audio from the original video clip by right clicking in the clip in the timeline and selecting detach audio and then deleted the separate audio file that was detached from the timeline altogether. The last thing you'll notice is that even though we created the audio file in GarageBand, which is Apple software after all, when we load it into iMovie, you can see these little red blobs in the audio section of the file. This basically means that the source file is too loud for iMovie to cope with, and the sound would get distorted if we did nothing. I don't know why this happens, but to fix it, we simply adjust the audio volume downwards a little bit. I found that moving it to 89% works perfectly. All that's now left to do is to export the file. Next, let's look at the final project from which I created the end file. Let's have a look at the files in the My Media section. Here are the video files I created. This is the main file that I created by combining the audio and video together, and then the two alternative camera angles I recorded to mix up the visuals a little. Here are some Christmas images that I simply downloaded from Pixabay. This is a free app that allows you to download lots of images completely free of charge that you can then use without needing to pay any royalties. Let me just give you a quick reminder of the bottom part of this screen. We have the main video slot where we will put the main file and this will always snap immediately to the first available spot in this slot. We also have what I'll call the B-roll area. The difference here is that we can put clips and images here and then move them around however we wish and they'll glue to the point on the main video file that we've chosen. So now let's look at the actual edit. The first thing that you might notice is that on the main timeline, there's a sort of black box here. This is actually a black background that I selected and put into the main timeline earlier at the start. The reason for this is that the main video clip would always snap itself to the very start of the timeline and I wanted to delay when this main clip would start playing ever so slightly. And to do that, the easiest way is to just basically insert this background. Now here is a short introductory segment that I created in Keynote. Again, this is something that is extremely easy to do and PowerPoint will do exactly the same thing for you. I just took some text and some images and some standard animation effects and then I exported that as a video file. And as you can see here, I wanted the main clip to start playing with an overlap to this introductory clip and that's why I use this little black background in the beginning of the slot. All I then had to do was put the introduction clip on top of the background so that that's what will display 
and then adjust the size of the black box until the main file will start playing at the point I want it to play. The next thing you'll notice here is the little Merry Christmas message. This is just a title using standard iMovie titles. The next thing we have is an image of Shepherds of the Manger, selected due to the title of the piece as you might guess. I simply dragged and dropped this from the My Media area and placed it on top of the main file as you can see. I then just changed a few settings. It's set to cut away which is the default that generally appears when you do this and that basically what that means is that the clip below will be completely hidden by the clip above. It's 100% opaque so nothing of the clip underneath will show through and then I set it to fade in and out so it's not such an abrupt change from one image to the next. The next thing we have is part of one of the alternate views. I simply search through the other file to find the portion I wanted, the technical term for this is scrubbing, and then dropped it into the B-roll segment. To do the selection, I basically play through the other file while it's showing in the media viewer section. And when I get to the bit I want, I press I, which is for in, on my keyboard. And this sets the starting point that I want to extract. And then I select O for out, at the end of the part I want to extract. This then highlights the area and allows me to drag just that portion onto the main timeline. Again, in the settings, this is set to cut over, fully opaque, and with a fade. Now to make this even more interesting, what I've then done is applied what they call a Ken Burns effect to it. So Ken Burns is simply that effect where you pan across either an image or a video clip. To do this, I simply selected a starting point and then a, a finishing point so that on playback, the clip will slowly pan from one point to the other. And that gives you an effect something like this. I followed exactly the same process to add this next alternative view to the B-roll, including setting Ken Burns again. And then the next thing I did was to add a Christmassy image to break up the visuals. However here, notice that I changed the opacity ever so slightly so that you can actually still see the original clip just underneath. Pretty much all of the remaining elements now are just rinse and repeat. However, one last little trick that's interesting is this particular image here. This is actually what's known as a PNG file. These are useful little image files that basically have a transparent background. And when you look at it here, it looks as though everything's black because of course there are black parts of the image on a black background, so you only see the little white dots. But when we put it onto the B-roll slot, if we select picture in picture from the settings, it allows us to have just the image itself show without obscuring the image beneath it. Finally, the closing slot is exactly like the opening slot. I created a short video file using Keynote, combining a few images, some text and some standard animations. And there you have the entire project. All that remains now is to export the results, and we're done. So I hope you found this video helpful to you and that you'll have great fun as you record your piano. Again, I've linked the playlist in the description below and of course a link to my free ebook so that you can download that and you'll be able to see step by step how to do all of the individual things that we've talked about here. So if you're not already, then please do subscribe to Tommy's Piano Corner. Don't forget to click that little bell icon so you're notified of new videos as and when they're released. I thank you very much for watching and we'll see you soon.